Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be addressing one of the most badass women in history that I think I've ever stumbled across. I've been obsessed with her story and her history and everything for years, even though I cannot pronounce her name for shit. Her name is Empress Wu Zetian, and I'm gonna be simplifying things just a little bit today. I'm not gonna cover every single thing, but she is by far one of the most fascinating empresses of China, and I like absolutely love looking into history about her, so I figured I'd share. So let's take a look at some of the highlights of her history and what happened during her rule and just jump right into it. So some narratives say that she killed her sister, butchered her elder brothers, murdered the ruler, and poisoned her mother. She's been painted as a usurper who was physically cruel with quote, a heart like a serpent and a nature like that of a wolf, end quote. It's even been said that she was hated by gods and men alike, which is one hell of a claim if I've ever heard one. But is that the truth? Who is she really? Well, Wu Xiao, also known as Wu Zetian, was born in 624 AD during the Tang Dynasty. Multiple sources, in fact, say that the Tang Dynasty was the golden age for women, in no small part because of Wu Zetian herself, according to one source. The Tang Dynasty was a time of relative freedom for women. They did not bind their feet nor lead submissive lives. It was a time in which a number of exceptional women contributed in the areas of culture and politics. So it is no surprise that Wu, born into a rich and noble family, was taught to play music, write, and read Chinese classics. By 13 years of age, she was well known for her wit, intelligence, and beauty, and she was recruited to the court of the emperor Tai Tsung. She soon became his favorite concubine. Now, some sources say she was 14, not 13, but I think you get the point here is that she was very, very young when this all happened. It's said that Wu's mother was upset about losing her daughter to the palace, but Wu told her mother, how do you know that it is not my fortune to meet the son of heaven, AKA the emperor? As for Wu, some sources say that Emperor Tai Tsung or Tai Tsung named her Mei Niang or Beautiful Girl, one of the names commonly and wrongly attributed to her birth name. One source says that the emperor was surprised she could read and write and he promoted her in a way. Instead of taking care of royal laundry as a 50 year concubine, Wu was made his secretary. In this position, she was constantly involved in affairs of the state at the highest level. She proved herself and stood out among the other concubines. One story says that once the emperor received a beautiful tribute horse from the Western region named Piebald Lion, but no one could break him. The young concubine Wu volunteered to try saying she needed three things, an iron whip, an iron hammer, and a dagger. Wu Zetian explained she first let the horse know the rules regarding what should be done and what shouldn't. When it failed to abide by those rules, she whipped it. When it failed again, she hammered it. And finally, if it still failed to obey, she killed it. The emperor was impressed with the beautiful woman's resolution and courage, but was also startled by her unrelenting high hand. However, Tai Zong wasn't around very long. Well, at least not in today's episode. In 649, Gao Zong, also known as Cao Zong in some sources, took the throne after his father passed away. His personal name is Li Che, another name my sources use, so I apologize for the confusion of the names here, but there is some speculation that Wu and Li were actually sleeping together and having an affair before Tai Song passed away, but some sources don't mention it at all, so take that as you will. The point is that the emperor's son became emperor and he absolutely had eyes for Wu. When Tai Zong died, Wu and the other concubines had their heads shaved and were sent to Ganye Temple to begin their lives as nuns. This was a common practice after the death of an emperor. The emperor's concubines could not be passed on to be used by others, but were forced to end their time at court and start a new life of chastity in a religious order. However, when Li became emperor and took the name Cao Song, one of the first things he did was send for Wu and have her brought back to court as the first of his concubines, even though he had others and also a wife. Other sources implied that this wasn't just because Wu was beautiful and Gao Song wanted another concubine. It's believed that they did have a genuine connection. On the first anniversary of his father's death, Gao Song visited the Gai Ye temple where Wu was a Buddhist nun and they wept together. He apparently paid regular visits there, hoping to see Wu. The emperor's wife initially seemed to respond well to this. At the time, Gao Song's wife, Lady Wang, had fallen out of favor because she was unable to bear him any children. 
Gao Song seemed completely taken by his first rank concubine who bore him a son and two daughters. It's said that Wang encouraged Wu to stop shaving her hair and gain Gao Song's attention so that he wouldn't be so distracted by the other concubine. Wu was given the title of second concubine, but relatively soon after, Wang seemed to regret her decision. It's said that the new emperor's wife, Lady Wang, was upset by the favor that her husband showed Wu after she gave birth to two sons in a row. At this moment, Wu Zetian had committed no crimes that we know of, she simply fell into favor. However, this is where history starts to get a little messy and Wu becomes more questionable and a controversial figure. According to one source, in 1654, Wu gave birth to a daughter who died shortly after she was born. The baby showed signs of having been strangled or suffocated in her crib and Wu claimed that Lady Wang had killed her out of jealousy. Wang was also the last person seen in the room and had no alibi. Wu also accused Lady Wang and her mother of practicing witchcraft and implied Lady Xiao, Gao Zong's former first concubine, that Lady Wang was found guilty of all charges and so were the others. Gao Zong divorced his wife, barred her mother from the palace and exiled Lady Zhao. Lady Wang's uncle, the chancellor Liu Shi, was removed from his post, which meant his son was cut off as Gao Song's heir. Wu was now raised to the position of first wife of Gao Song and Empress of China. She was also assured that her sons would rule the country after the death of her husband. The story of Wu's murder and her daughter and framing Lady Wang is infamous. Historians sided with Lady Wang and believe she was framed, but does that mean they're correct? Perhaps the people who accused her of killing the child were those opposed to her rise to power. There were plenty of people that didn't want Wu to marry Gao Song as it was considered incest as Wu Zetian had been Gao Song's father's concubine. Now don't get me wrong, if Wu Zetian did murder her own daughter to rise to power, then that would be really messed up. Building an empire on the back of your murdered daughter is not a good look to say the very least. However, I find it interesting that there isn't the evidence to support this one particular infamous claim. It said that Wu ordered Lady Wang and Lady Chao's hands and feet to be lobbed off and that their mutilated bodies be tossed into a vat of wine. Now these two witches can get drunk to their bones, she's quoted as saying. Whether or not this is fury at them killing her daughter or torturing two innocent women, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to say with 100% certainty. Aside from Wu or Wang, there is a third option here that some scholars have put on the table, crib death. Sudden infant death syndrome, also known as crib death, is said to be caused from brain defects when an infant has less control of automatic processes such as breathing and heart rate because their brain isn't mature enough to work properly. There's other factors involved, but this very well could have been a factor in Wu's daughter's death. Another source known as the exasperated historian, which I love the name by the way, also suggests that the baby could have died from carbon monoxide poisoning. This is because ventilation systems at the time were either non-existent or of poor quality, and the lack of ventilation combined with using coal as a heating method could have built up fumes. I will say that this is absolutely a murky area, and I've got to wonder if there's a particular reason this baby died of carbon monoxide poisoning when others didn't. Maybe Wu's daughter was being kept in a particularly badly insulated room, maybe the baby simply wasn't as strong as others, I have no idea whatsoever but I do find it fascinating that the narrative is so often told that Wu murdered her own child to gain power. One book called Wu by Jonathan Clements is one of these narratives. One website discusses his book and says that this is the story it tells. Before Wu was born, prophecies predicted that she would become an emperor. It was thus a source of disappointment to her family when she turned out to be a girl, but they underestimated Wu's steely determination to succeed. At age 13, she took the first steps on her path to power when she was selected as a concubine to the 40-year-old Supreme Emperor. When the Emperor fell ill, the ambitious Wu committed a capital crime by seducing his heir. Her gamble paid off, and when the Emperor died, his bestoddled heir, now the High Emperor, rescued Wu from a life in convent. Wu wasted no time in framing and executing her opposition, the Empress and the beautiful pure concubine. Again, whether or not Wu did actually frame Zhao and Lady Wang, I'm not exactly sure it's responsible to present this as fact. Unless we can state with 100% certainty that Wu did in fact kill her daughter, that's a bold claim to make. It's possible, but it's also possible that Lady Wang might've done this too. But anyway, with Lady Wang and Zhao removed, Wu and the emperor were married. Yet within five years, the emperor suffered a debilitating stroke and Wu, as his wife, took over all administrative duties. 
She even started a secret police force to spy on her enemies and imprison or kill anyone that got in her way. For many years, she ruled by Cao Song's side this way, and there was peace and contentment during his reign. An invasion into North Korea was successful and Korea was made a vassal state in 668. And yet, as Britannica puts it, he proved to be a weak ruler and in his later years was dominated by his consort, Wu Sao, the future Empress Wu Ho, a former concubine of his father. Gao Song had rescued her from the convent to which she had been sent upon Tai Song's death. After Gao Song's death, Wu attempted to rule through puppets until 690 when she usurped the throne herself. If you ask me, this is another gray area where even Britannica sort of throws Wu under the bus. They say she was just a former concubine to his father and Gao Song rescued her only for her to usurp him. Gao Song didn't prove to be a weak ruler. He had a debilitating stroke and she was left handling his affairs. Don't get me wrong, Wu was absolutely ruthless and I'm not trying to paint the picture that she wouldn't hurt a fly, cause she would. I just think it's interesting that both men and women throughout history have been bloodthirsty, vicious, murdered their opponents, but when Wu does it, she creates far, far more controversy. But this was only the beginning. Gao Song died in 683 when Wu would have been almost 60 years old. She remained the power behind the throne, though at the time it was Wu's sons that stood in her way. After all, they were the ones set to inherit the throne, according to one source. One, the crowned prince was believed to be poisoned after challenging the empress. Another of them was sent into exile where he was forced to take his own life. Her other son, Li Hong, became emperor after her husband died, but Wu didn't like how much he was pushing his own agenda instead of doing as she wanted. Wu charged them with treason and they were both banished. Her youngest son finally became emperor. However, he lived under house arrest. So Wu made all his decisions for him before she forced him to abdicate. At the point of her youngest son's abdication, Wu Zetian became China's only female emperor in history. She worked through a network of spies and secret police and even paid informants to come to the court and give accounts of anything that they knew. If she wanted to get rid of anyone, she had the means of gathering dirt on him or her and the necessary power to have that person exiled or executed. Any plot against her was quickly unearthed and those who served as her spies were richly rewarded. No one dared to stand in her way. This may be true, but other sources paint a very different picture. One states that Wu did in fact place her first son on the throne who took the world title Chong Zong. However, he refused to cooperate and his wife, Lady Wei, assumed too much power. Lady Wei tried to use the throne for selfish purposes, demanding her husband push through other measures that would favor her family. Wu could no longer tolerate her daughter-in-law's disrespect and her son's refusal to discipline her. So she had him charged with treason and banished. So yes, she did banish her own son, but if this was true, it kind of sounds like it was for the best. Well, at least for the time being it was. Others say this was Wu's greatest mistake, to marry her son to a concubine as ruthless and ambitious as herself. We'll see Chong Zong again in a moment, but for now, let's keep moving ahead. Now, if Wu Zetian was this bloodthirsty, throne grabbing, usurping, horrible ruler, then I feel like she would have tried to rule right then and there. She would have said, hey, my sons aren't fit to rule. I'm going to rule, deal with it. Or if she was brutal enough to kill her own child to gain power, she could have done far worse than banish her sons, right? But sources indicate that this isn't what happened either. Instead, she placed her second son, Rui Song, on the throne. He was under some sort of house arrest because he too was in fact a disappointment. She forced him to abdicate in 690 and proclaimed herself Emperor Zetian, ruler of China and the first and only woman to sit on the dragon throne and reign in her own name and by her own authority. Her last name Wu is often associated with the words for weapon and military force. And she chose the name Zetian, which means ruler of the heavens. She wanted to make it clear that a new kind of ruler had taken the throne of China and a new order had arrived. There's many different ways you can see this. History and multiple sources have shown this as a wicked woman taking the throne away from their rightful heirs. You could see it also as a woman who for many years in effect ruled while her husband was unable to, wanted the person that sat on the throne to know what they were doing and she was the one. Personally, I feel like the truth lies somewhere in between. As for one of her sons being forced to take his own life, some sources disagree and say that they were executed in 693. One reads, It is easier to take seriously the suggestion that Wu arranged a series of murders within her own family. 
These began in 666 with the death by poison of a teenage niece who had attracted Cao Song's admiring gaze and continued in 674 with the suspicious demise of Wu's able eldest son, Crown Prince Li Hong, and the discovery of several hundred suits of armor in the stables of a second son who was promptly demoted to rank of commoner on suspicion of treason. Historians remain divided as to how far Wu benefited from the removal of these potential obstacles. What can be said is that her third son, who succeeded his father, Emperor Chongzong in 684, lasted less than two months before being banished at his mother's instigation in favor of a more tractable fourth, Rizong. It is also generally accepted that Rui Zong's wife, Empress Liu, and Chief Consort Do were executed at Wu's behest in 693 on trumped up charges of witchcraft. There are abundant signs that Wu was viewed with deep suspicion by later generations of Chinese. Her giant stone memorial placed at one side of the spirit road leading to her tomb remains blank. It is the only known uncarved memorial tablet in more than 2000 years of imperial history. It's mutinous, chillingly reminiscent of the attempts made by Hatshepsut's successors to obliterate her name from the stone records of Pharaohic Egypt. And while China's imperial chronicles were too rigidly run and too highly developed for Wu's name to be simply wiped from their pages, the stern disapproval of the Confucian mandarins who compiled the records can still be read 1500 years later. Obviously, I can't say what happens for sure, Historians disagree, my sources disagree, and there's many, many different stories about how Wu treated her son. Whether she was ruthless or banished them with just cause, you'll have to decide for yourself. Hell, one source even claims that in 690, she didn't force her son to abdicate, but that he removed himself from office. And this quite frankly, I find incredibly believable because Ruizong actually abdicated the throne for weak reasons again later in life, though we'll get to that in just a bit. Aside from the controversy surrounding her family, the thing I do find hypocritical and kind of hilarious is how upset people were that Wu Zetian had a harem of male concubines in her old age. As historian Mike Dash said, in her 70s, Wu showered special favor on two smooth-cheeked brothers, the Zhang brothers, both boy singers, the nature of whose private relationship with their imperial mistress have never been precisely determined. One of the brothers she declared had a face as beautiful as a lotus flower, while it is said she valued the other for his talents in the bedchamber. The Empress, greatly weakened by infirmity and old age, would allow no one but the Sang brothers by her side. In fact, her infatuation with the two young men drew the ire of officials in the court who realized that she was neglecting her state duties. One account actually shows that court officials became so furious that they raided the palace, decapitated the Sang brothers, and commandeered the government. Still, Wu continued her downward spiral, which now included drug addiction in her addition to time with her male concubines. Her paranoia increased so that anyone who opposed her would be banished, imprisoned, or executed. In time, her son, Chang Song, had to be brought back from his banishment to take over as emperor. So emperors can have concubines, but when Wu takes an interest in younger males, it's infuriating to the court. I mean, come on, you guys can't tell me that is not a double standard. Also, as a side note, some sites say that they were 20 something years old, so she even had better standards than the emperor who made her a concubine at around 13 or 14. Then again, there's also speculation that they may have not been in a relationship with her at all. One source states, the other quite literally colorful men with whom she famously spent her waning years were were the 20 something Sang brothers. Two flamboyant men who wore operatic makeup and flashy outfits. Many histories depict them in a romantic relationship with then 70 year old Wu. However, it seems more likely that they were gay and or possibly castrated. The Zhangs were party animals, taking full advantage of Wu's good graces to run the government offices like a brothel. Finally, they infuriated others to the point where a group of nobles stormed Wu's palace, cut off their heads and took control of the government. Wu's response? To gently chide the rebels and go back to bed. As for the other point made about her paranoia, I can't blame Wu for that in the slightest. If I were her, I would have been a little bit paranoid that someone would banish or execute me too. The court wasn't and didn't ever seem to be in favor of her rule. I'm not saying it just to justify anything she's ever done. She was most certainly brutal. Just perhaps not quite as brutal as history tends to portray. Anyway, ultimately in 705, Chong Zong and his wife returned and Wu abdicated the throne. However, now that we know a bit more about Wu and how she took the throne, let's talk about how she used it. Was she a terrible ruler that deserved to be seen in this poor light? Well, frankly, no, I don't think so. 
As for what Wu did during her reign, she placed Buddhism over Taoism as the favored state religion. She's said to have reduced the army's size and stopped the influence of aristocratic military men on government by replacing them with scholars. Everyone had to compete for government positions by taking exams, thus settling the practice of government run by scholars. Wu also was fair to peasants, lowering oppressive taxes, raising agricultural production, and strengthening public works. She was, as some sources might say, paranoid, yet others would say Wu was simply listening and squashing out opponents. Apparently, Wu installed a series of copper boxes in the capital in which citizens could post anonymous denunciations of one another. She maintained her secret police and as one poet wrote, all fell before her moth brows. She whispered slander from behind her sleeves. Her giant stone memorial that we mentioned earlier seems to obliterate her name from the eyes of history. The thing is, as the Smithsonian Magazine puts it, it may be helpful to consider that there were, in effect, two empresses, the one who maintained a reign of terror over the innermost circle of government and the one who ruled more benignly over 50 million Chinese commoners. Although the circle of government may have seen her as a threat, a usurper, a brutal, ruthless murderer, Wu Zetan did have to maintain this image in order to keep the throne, yet she did right by her people. Seen from this perspective, Wu did in fact fulfill the fundamental duties of a ruler in imperial China. Confucian philosophy held that while an emperor should not be condemned for acts that would be crimes in the subject, he could be punished harshly for allowing the state to fall into anarchy. C.P. Fitzgerald, who reminds us that Tang China emerged from 400 years of discord and civil war, writes, without Wu, there would have been no long enduring Tang dynasty and perhaps no lasting unity in China. While in a generally favorable portrayal, Guizhou argues that Wu was not so different from most emperors. The empress was a woman of her times. Her social, economic, and judicial views could hardly be deemed advanced, and her politics differed from those of her predecessors, chiefly in their greater pragmatism and ruthlessness. Even the terror of the 680s in this view was a logical response to entrenched bureaucratic opposition to Wu's side. This opposition was formidable. The annals of the period contained numerous examples of criticism levied by civil servants mortified by the Empress's innovations. At one point, to the horror of her generals, Wu proposed raising a military corps from among China's numerous enukes. It was the common for poor Chinese boys to voluntarily undergo emasculation in the hope of obtaining a prestigious and well remunerated post in the imperial service. She was also the most important early supporter of the alien religion of Buddhism, which during her rule surpassed the native Confucian and Taoist faiths in influence within the Tang realm. If we look at Wu's reign outside of the relationship she had with other leaders, a very different story emerges. Her reputation was improved considerably in recent years because, well, Wu was ahead of her times in many aspects. She even promoted women's rights, or as much as they could be considered women's rights in that day. She required women to mourn both parents, not only their father as the practice had only been until then. She even advised scholars to write and edit biographies of exemplary women and formed the group Scholars of the Northern Gate to promote literary pursuits. Even some of the crimes that are attributed to her, such as amputating a victim's hands and feet and leaving them to drown, suspiciously resembled that adopted by her predecessor, the Han era Empress Lu Si. It was Lu who in 194 BC wreaked revenge on a rival by gouging out her eyes, amputating her arms and legs and forcing her to drink acid that destroyed her vocal cords. The mute and limbless concubine was then tossed into a cesspit in the palace with the swine. It seems possible that the fate ascribed to Wang and Xiao was a chronicler's invention intended to link Wu to the worst monster in China's history. I can't say for sure if this is accurate, but it does seem like an incredibly specific way to kill someone. Given how much people hated her at the time, I would not be surprised if this was in fact a fabricated story. It could be that Wu purportedly emulated Lu Si and that she wasn't someone to be messed with. I can't know for certainty anyway. Regardless, I think a lot of the evidence against Wu is a bit suspicious or at the very least cherry picked and portrayed in a way that makes her look bad. Seriously, she's some vixen for having a harem, but men having concubines was commonplace? Other sources also explain that during the 50 years she was in charge, whether beside her husband or alone, the empire was relatively stable, peaceful, powerful, and prosperous. Her sponsorship of Buddhism, perhaps from the time she was sent off to be a Buddhist nun, resulted in the construction of many new pilgrimage Buddhist sites. Monumental statues were carved during her rule and several have been carved in her liking since then. 
Though her belief in Buddhism was a strategic move that combated Confucian beliefs, which were strongly against female rulers, she did seem genuine in her belief in Buddhism as well. She ordered and helped translate Buddhist scriptures that would support her rule and with her own money became a patron of temples. For example, the Grand Verochana Buddha that was important, a building as large imposing statues that was a way of keeping up with rivals and outdoing them, while helping to show her worthiness as a ruler and also acting as a site where rituals could be performed to display that she held a mandate from the Buddha. She invited scholars to China to assist on these cultural endeavors and treated the monks with great respect, even bowing before them if they visited her at the palace. In return, Buddhist monks declared that the heavenly God bestowed power on her. When she abdicated the throne before her death, Wu Zetian became a Buddhist nun again. So I'm inclined to believe that she wasn't just using this religion to promote herself without having any faith in it. It's also said that in 693, Wu wrote a two volume rules for officials and made it part of the examination curriculum, replacing the old Taoistic classic, Dao De Jing. She even initiated the personal examination of candidates by the ruler because she believed the system could best serve her objective of effective imperial management. The civil service examination was not new in Tang China, but Wu's reforms would serve as a foundation for later dynasties developing an even stronger examination system. Some say many of the claims against Wu are false and the idea of her being evil stems from sexism. Others say that within these rule books, she instructed the secret police about employing brutal methods of torture. Others tried to be like Wu in later years. Princess Taiping, her daughter, and Empress Wei, her daughter-in-law, became involved in imperial politics as well. Empress Wei perhaps had pretensions of emulating Wu. In 710, she murdered her husband by poisoning him and then engineered a coup hoping to rule after him. However, her planned takeover failed and Empress Wei was executed. Princess Taiping, though wielding great power at the imperial court, did no better in attempting to follow in her mother's footsteps. As far as I can tell when looking at multiple sources, Taiping's history is complicated, just as her mother's is. She was known as the princess who saved the state when she reinstated Changzong to the throne, removing her mother from power. When he passed away five years later, she helped restore another brother, Ruizong, to the throne. Ruizong, Wu's son, the one whose wife and chief consort may have been killed by Wu, is said to have abdicated in 712 when she suggested that a comet was a sign his rule was over. He abdicated and his son, Li Longji, took over as Emperor Zhuangzong. Yet another source says that Taiping's issue wasn't Ruizong, but his son. Li Longji apparently listened to advisors instead of her, and in 712, she didn't tell Ruizong a comment or that the stars were telling him to abdicate, but she told him to watch the stars to convince Ruizong that his son was planning a coup. When the plan backfired, she plotted to overthrow Li or newly instated Emperor Xiongzong. I did find a source that was able to provide a direct quote from Mao's wife. And Mao, if you didn't know, by the way, is the former chairman in the Communist Party of China. That source reads, Mao's wife and her group of writers extolled Wu Zetian as a legalist empress. Interestingly, the qualities praised positively below by these writers were the same qualities depicted by Confucian scholars to denounce and vilify Wu Zetian, quote, She was experienced in using violent dictatorship, which enabled her and her innovative political group to rule as long as 50 years, a period of progressive significance in Chinese history. During her 50 years in power, Wu Zetian never consulted with Confucian scholars about political issues, and she pursued the legalist innovative line with a spirit of going against the tide. With her own personal experience, Wu Zetian effectively criticized the Confucian fallacies of man being superior and women being inferior and woman being difficult to be with. She had proven herself a remarkable stateswoman in Chinese history, end quote. The fact is that many women did gain power, such as Hatshepsut in ancient Egypt, Catherine the Great in Russia, or Trung Trak of Vietnam, and of course, Wu were rarely chosen by their people. They would gain power by default or stealth if a king was debilitated or had no sons. Therefore, it was always harder for a woman to rule effectively when in early periods of history, monarchs were first and foremost military leaders. So queens and empresses were forced to rule like men and yet roundly criticized when they did so. Sweden's fascinating Queen Christina was nearly as infamous for eschewing her side saddle and riding in breeches as she was for the more momentous decision that she took to convert to Catholicism. 
While mustering her troops in 1588, as the Spanish Armada sailed up the channel, even Elizabeth I felt constrained to being the moral boosting address with the denial of her sex. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. Again, I'm not trying to say you have to love Wu or think she's a flawless leader. I don't think anyone is, but she had a love for her people, an effective and prosperous reign. And I do feel that for much of history, she hasn't really been given credit where to do. All in all, Wu's impact was massive, whether or not you love or hate her. There was even a TV drama about her, but because of its scandalous depiction of actress Fan Bingbing in the role of Wu and the portrayal of women in sexuality, it was censored, thereby making it less historically accurate. And sometimes history is scandalous. There is no denying that. As for Wu's resting place, I won't lie, it's a little bit hilarious. The Smithsonian states, in death as in life, Wu remains controversial. When she died, she was laid to rest in an elaborate tomb in the countryside about 50 miles north of then capital Xi'an. It was approached via a mile long causeway running between two low hills topped with watchtowers, known today as the Nipple Hills because Chinese tradition holds that the spot was selected because the hills reminded Kao Song of the young Wu's breasts. At the end of the Spirit Road, the tomb itself lies in a remarkably inaccessible spot, set into a mountain at the end of a winding forest path. No one knows what secrets it holds, for many like the tombs of most celebrated Chinese rulers, including that of the first emperor himself, it has never been plundered or opened by archeologists. She's resting at the road past the Nipple Hills. I know I probably sound like a child laughing at this a little bit, but hey, after all these dark and depressing topics here, I guess there's something that's kind of entertaining at the end. Anyway, with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode. And for the record, this is literally like the shortest, briefest overview I think I could really give about Wu. She did so many incredible things and and things that I really think there's a lot of great documentaries that talk with the archeologists that did some like exhuming and excavating about stuff during her era that you should really check out. Like there's a whole thing about this beautiful jeweled headdress that she had with jewels that were from like uh, Arabian princes and from Europe and things like that, showing that she had like this great diplomatic power with other countries outside of China. Like there's so much about her that was so damn cool. But I hope this piqued your interest just a little bit about Wu Zetian, a empress that just isn't really talked about a lot, I think, and really deserves to be talked about more. So I hope you all learned something today and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Prism of the Past. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes just like this one. And if you'd like to follow me outside of these episodes, you can go to my Linktree link, which will have links for all of my social media and projects I'm involved with, like my Twitter, Discord, Twitch, all of those good things will be in the Linktree link. So thank you all for making it to another episode. I love you all and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.